Okay, so um, we are moving on now, and we're gonna today we're gonna talk about the Cappadocians, and um, we have already covered the uh, the Council of Nicaea, and then we went kind of ahead of ourselves to talk about the Council of Constantinople so that we could finish our conversation on the creed, just so that we could do the creed all at once. But in reality, we have to back up a little bit and talk about some of the things that took place between those first two ecumenical councils. So we're still in the fourth century, and we are gonna talk about the Cappadocians, or as some people pronounce it, the Cappadocians. And actually, that's probably more right, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> the Cappadocians, or uh, alternately, the Cappadocian Fathers. Now, um, we're talking about uh, a place, Cappadocia is a Roman province in Asia Minor, and so by calling them the Cappadocians, we're saying this is where they're from. And specifically, we're talking about three theologians, Basil, Caesarea, now by the way, this is Caesarea in Cappadocia, this is not the same as the Caesarea um, on the coast of Palestine that we saw, like with, for example, Eusebius of Caesarea. It's a different city. And unfortunately, you know, this one also named after Caesar, so it can be a little confusing. But at any rate, we're talking about Basil. We're talking about Basil's brother, Gregory. Gregory of Nyssa. And their friend, also named Gregory, Gregory of Nazianzus. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. Gregory of Nazianzus. Okay, so these three theologians are the, the ones that we refer to as the Cappadocians or, or the Cappadocian Fathers. And um, they become extremely important in that time period between the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. By the way, um, Cappadocian Caesarea is the capital of the region of Cappadocia. And if you think of it on the, on the route from Constantinople to Antioch, um, it's, it becomes an important city because it's on, it's on that route. Now, all three of these theologians uh, come from wealthy families, which means they have access to the best education. It also means they are open to philosophy. Now, in the West, we've We've seen people like Irenaeus and Tertullian. Tertullian famously said, you know, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Meaning, what does philosophy have to do with theology? And making that distinction. But the older tradition, going all the way back to the apologists, was to see philosophy as uh, at least potentially a positive thing. And maybe not make so much of a distinction between philosophy and theology. Now we're kind of back to that. Or in some ways, maybe the Eastern Church never really lost it. Um, and so, you know, these, uh, these theologians are educated. They're educated in, um, you know, Greco-Roman thought, philosophy. Um, and also, interestingly enough, because they were from wealthy families and because they were, um, you know, meant to be given a good education, the best education possible, they... Uh, they postponed their, their baptisms until adulthood. And this is a, a decision that their parents would have made to sort of leave their options open for secular careers. In the end, they all chose um, monastic or church careers, and so they all chose to get baptized. Um, they knew Athanasius, who died in 373. Athanasius um, had a long career. He died in 373, and so these guys sort of pick up from, from Athanasius as the defenders of Nicene Orthodoxy. And so they're heavily influenced by Athanasius. They're all ascetics, and they all supported monasticism. And we're going to talk a little bit about monasticism in, in the next hour. But just to point out that you know, the monastic tradition is uh, often has a lot to do with, well, you know, being alone, right? If you're, you know, if you're a hermit, you live out in the desert by yourself. So being alone means there's really nobody to talk to. So it's, it, it has a lot to do with finding God in the silence. 
You know, in, in academic worlds, we try to find God in all the words. Um, but, but they understood about finding God in the silence, which meant that they are proponents of what we call the apophatic tradition or the via negativa. Via negativa, the, the negative way, the way of negation. In other words, sometimes the, you know, the best you can say about what God is is really just to say what God is not. Sometimes all we know about God is to admit that God is mystery, to admit our humility before the unknowable, and, um, and, and, and to say you know, what we know God is not, but maybe not to be quite as bold about saying what we think God is. Now, having said that, these guys were not afraid to say what they thought God was or is. So, um, but, but as monastics, they really just wanted a life of study. They wanted to live, a, you know, a sort of a life that wealth can afford, uh, a life of privilege, a life of contemplative study. But in one way or another, they are all pressed into service as clergy. Now, um, one of the greatest contributions that they make to the church is in clarifying the theological language. The Council of Nicaea. You remember that when we were talking about the Council of Nicaea, we, um, we, we ran into a word, this word homoousios, right? Homoousios, same essence. And this essence language was exactly the thing that some of the, um, some of the bishops were not comfortable with. This question of, you know, uh, the father and son being of the same essence sounded like modalism to some people. Sounded like too much unity. Sounded like confusing the father with the son. Like as if you're saying they're one and the same. And so a lot of people were uncomfortable with this Lucia language. And in fact, um, in the, uh, uh, the Creed of Nicaea, the original one with the anathemas, um, the language used in that was not very precise because you have this Usia language for essence, but you also have this word hypostasis. Hypostasis. Hypo as in under, like a hypodermic needle. Hypodermis goes under the skin, right? Under. And stasis is, is um, a state of being. So hypostasis is that which stands under. It's not doesn't mean understanding. It means that which stands under, like as in an underlying reality. So you know, in some sense, the uh, Council of Nicaea was using these words interchangeably. The problem is, is that some people in the East were using this word to talk about the oneness of God, one usia, and they were using this word to talk about the threeness of God. So the Trinity was one usia and three hypostases. Some people, though, were using this word to talk about the oneness of God and saying God is one hypostasis. Well, all that is to say that, that these words, that these, this semantic issue had to be nailed down and uh, the Cappadocians were instrumental in clarifying before the Council of Constantinople in 381, clarifying that, that the standard Greek terminology in the church was going to be uh, one usia, three hypostases. So uh, this is the equivalent of Tertullian's one substance, three persons. But it took a long time, actually, for that to catch on. In fact, even by the time of Augustine, we haven't talked about Augustine yet, but if you read um, some of Augustine's works, he will say that when it comes time to translate between Greek and Latin, we're not sure what words mean what, right? Um, people are using the same words to mean different things, and people are using different words to mean the same things. And so in the debates that we're going to talk about, um, to actually, you know, over the next couple of weeks, this semantic issue plays a big part. And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of problems because people are talking past each other and they're not agreeing on the definitions of words. Um, but anyway, as it's going to play out, usia or essence, essence becomes the word 
that is um, equivalent with Tertullian's substance. So there's one essence in the Trinity. And then hypostasis is going to be the word that, uh, that becomes the equivalent of Tertullian's uh, persona or person. So this is the same as three persons. I don't know if you can even see that down there. Sorry about that. But you get the idea. One essence, three hypostases. And that's the language that the uh, Cappadocians will begin to clarify and solidify for the church. And what that does for the church is it allows a lot of people who were uncomfortable with the creed of Nicaea to start to get on board with it and to start to accept Nicene uh, theology as acceptable. And so that in the time period between the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Cal uh, Constantinople in 381, Nicene Orthodoxy sort of comes around to be um, accepted by by most of the bishops in the East. Some, some even who had supported Arius would be able to get on board with it and accept it. Um, now, at the same time though, there were those bishops who had opposed the idea of homoousios, who had opposed the idea of essence language, who started to come on board and say, okay, we'll give you that the father and son are of the same essence, but not the Holy Spirit. You know, they, they'll say, we'll give you the divinity of the Son. We'll accept that, but not the Spirit. The Spirit's not divine. And so there was a, a, a group that emerges after the Council of Nicaea that wants to deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, pretty much all of the debate that centered around the Son at Nicaea <coughs> is now projected on the Spirit. And the same sorts of questions are being asked about the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit uh, created, like an angelic spirit, or is the Holy Spirit creator, divine? Is the Holy Spirit co-eternal with the Father and the Son? And um, so the people who are asking those questions and the people who are denying the divinity of the Holy Spirit are given a name. Pneumatomachians. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't make these things up. But it means, uh, it means spirit fighters. Pneuma, spirit. Spirit fighters in the sense that these are the ones who supposedly fight against the spirit. So they're, you know, um, they're labeled people who fight against the Holy Spirit because they deny the divinity of the Spirit. They're also referred to as Macedonians after one of their leaders. But so they become a faction of sorts or a group of factions after the Council of Nicaea and in that period between Nicaea and Constantinople. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the three Cappadocians kind of in order and uh, you know, tell you what their contribution is and we'll see where that takes us. The one thing I want to say at the beginning is you are going to read a document called The Life of Macrina. Macrina is the older sister of Basil and Gregory. And she is really their first <coughs> teacher of theology. Um, there is a strong tradition of the women in this family learning theology from important theologians in the East. And um, so Macrina becomes the first teacher of, of Basil and Gregory, and, and she's the one who encourages them into uh, the monastic life. Which, when you read the life of Macrina, the monastic life is called the life of philosophy. So the word philosophy comes to be kind of a, a, a code for the monastic life, so watch for that. All right, so let's talk about Basil of Caesarea. Basil is born somewhere around 329 or 330, and he died in 379. And so you'll notice there, right, right there, that he did not quite make it to the Council of Constantinople in 381. Um, he is uh, one 
of four so-called Eastern doctors of the church. The doctors of the church are theologians who are sort of designated as uh, especially important. He is also known as Basil the Great. Um, all right, so even though it was uh, Macrina who convinces Basil to go into the monastic life because she went there first, um, in fact, Macrina convinced all of her brothers to become ascetics. When they had all sort of trained for these careers as basically the ancient world's equivalent of a lawyer, um, she's the one who convinced them to, uh, to become ascetics. And she seems to have been the real pioneer in the family, uh, creating a family monastery on their estate where they took in homeless people, homeless women, um, and uh, and you know created this monastery with their mother and uh, and and really sort of took the took Paul's words in Galatians to heart this idea that there's no longer slave or free and so basically the people that were up until that point servants in that household became monastics alongside of the you know the the, the mistress of the house and the sister so. Um, so, so Macrina is the one who really pioneers all this, but then Basil will come along and he will write a rule, a rule of life, that will influence all of monasticism after him. Uh, after his studies, he traveled around to Egypt, Palestine, and Syria to meet the desert hermits in, in person. Um, and by their example and by Macrina's persistence, he eventually accepted the monastic life. And um, eventually, because of him, and in a large part because of him, the Eastern Church will come to the point where it's, it's pretty much assumed that the bishops ought to be monks. Now, you already know that one of the differences between the Eastern and the Western Church is that in the Western Church, the celibacy of the priesthood develops relatively early and, and eventually kind of sticks, more or less, to the point where now um, Western Roman Catholic priests are celibate, right? But you, you may know that the Eastern Orthodox priests are not necessarily celibate, so an Eastern Orthodox priest can be married and have a family. However, the bishops cannot. To be a bishop in the East still means to be celibate because the bishops come from the monasteries. So the idea is that the best bishops are the monastics, and, um, and this tradition really goes all the way back to the time of Basil. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that we, we've, well, a lot of what we've done so far has assumed that Christianity is an illegal persecuted sect, right? And so once we hit Constantine, though, Christianity is legalized. And um, after the legalization of Christianity, a lot of people become Christians for all the wrong reasons, because it's you know imitating the emperor, or for you know networking, for upward mobility, whatever. Um, you all of a sudden have a situation in the church that you didn't really have before, and that is that that people could become Christian and join the church for reasons other than actual faith. So now that Christianity is illegal, uh, that that now that Christianity is legal. To be converted in, a, in, in the sense of, in the Christian sense, now is going to come to mean something more than just joining the church. And so when you read the writings of the likes of the Cappadocians, you get the sense that, well, anybody can get baptized and join the church. But to really be converted is to sort of take on another whole level of commitment. And that often means taking on the life of philosophy or the ascetic life. Um, and, and so conversion is not anymore simply from paganism to Christianity. That's too easy. Conversion is now from nominal Christianity to true philosophy, meaning the ascetic life. So, um, you know, one of the issues the church has to deal with is, you know, whether it wants to promote this idea of sort of two classes of Christians. You know, the, the everyday Christian and the really committed Christian who has committed to a life of asceticism. Um, Basil is going to be the one, though, who will sort of critique 
the, the life of a hermit and say, you know, if, uh, if you always live alone, whose feet will you wash? So in other words, you know, how can you um, obey the second most important commandment, to love your neighbor, if you have completely withdrawn from society and you have no neighbor? So that's going to be an issue. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next hour, too. So Basil was uh, eventually coerced into being ordained a priest by the previous bishop of Caesarea. But when, when the previous bishop died in the year 370, it was not necessarily clear that Basil would be elected the next bishop. Now, if, you know, if you've been following along in the story, there are plenty of, of um, instances where, you know, famous theologian becomes sort of the, the deacon, right-hand man to the bishop, and then when the bishop dies, duh, you know, that famous theologian becomes the next bishop. And you almost expect that story to play out here. And it does, but it almost didn't. Basil almost didn't get elected because too many people feared that he would insist on too strict of a life for all Christians. In other words, if he's our, if he's our bishop, is he going to make us all be ascetics? That was the fear. Um, and he actually uh, had to enlist the help of the father of Gregory of Nazianzus, who was the current bishop of Nazianzus, to, to help get him elected. And this begins Basil on a path that uh, his career has often been criticized as being sort of opportunistic and um, maybe overly aggressive in terms of you know, working toward his own goals. In fact, even the Gregories will be annoyed with him at times um, for ways in which they felt they were manipulated by him. At any rate, he does become uh, the next bishop and he becomes the successor to Athanasius as the great defender of Nicene Orthodoxy. Now remember, Arianism hasn't gone away. So the, one of the first things Basil does when he, when he gets elected as Bishop of Caesarea is he works to get other Orthodox or, or Nicene bishops elected in other cities. He uh, got Gregory of Nazianzus elected as Bishop of a little town called Sasima. little sort of border town that was really only significant uh, because it was on a trade route. And Gregory of Nazianzus was annoyed with this to the point that he never set foot in that town, ever. And, um, and then he got, Basil also got his brother uh, elected as Bishop of Nyssa. And, and Basil himself would admit that those appointments were out of political convenience rather than because either of these two guys was ready to be bishop. And so he, so Basil was kind of annoyed with them for not being good bishops. They were annoyed with him for sort of forcing them to be bishops in these places that were supposedly strategic. But um, at any rate, uh, Gregory would later take over as acting bishop in Nazianzus after his father. And that's why we know him as Gregory of Nazianzus. But, you know, in spite of Basil's flaws, he makes a huge contribution to the church, especially to monasticism. I already mentioned that, you know, he, he came to an awareness that a solitary life was too much about individual salvation. And that, you know, that was too individualistic for him. He said, he, you know, you can't love your neighbor, you can't feed the hungry if you live as a hermit. Um, so the monastic life can't be all about withdrawal from society. Rather, it should be like what we read of in the second chapter of Acts, where the apostles and all of the disciples sort of lived communally, sharing what they had. That should be the model for the ascetic life. And so, while up until the time of Basil, the monks had been moving farther and farther out into the desert, Basil brings them back to the outskirts of the city and reorients the focus of the monastery outward in the sense of uh, you know, uh, ministry, ministry to the poor. And, uh, you know, one of the classic um, vows of the monastic life is poverty, but it's voluntary poverty. Voluntary poverty, Basil would say, is for the purpose of helping the poor, not just to be the poor, right? If you just take on a life of poverty to be in solidarity with the poor, 
the poor will say, gee, thanks. Right? But voluntary poverty should mean a self-sacrificial life so that one can help the poor, give to the poor. All right. Also, Basil said, you cannot learn humility and obedience if you answer to no one. This is the other problem with a totally solitary life. If you live a solitary life, you are your own boss, which you know sounds like a good idea, but how you know how will you grow in, in spiritual maturity if there is no one there to keep you humble? And so the one of the other classic vows of the monastic life is obedience. The rule of obedience brings the monks under the bishop's authority. Now, granted, he's the bishop, so you can see why he'd want to bring the monks under the bishop's authority. So there is some of that. But also, he truly believed that there was a, um, an advantage in terms of spiritual maturity here, that, that uh, monks ought to be under the authority of someone else. On the other hand, Basil always maintained that one can live as an ascetic without actually being a monk. So he did not require that everyone should be a monk. Um, in fact, he did not require that everyone should be celibate, obviously, because the struggle, the asceticism means striving, struggling, working. The struggle is an inner struggle. It's not an external struggle. Um, you know, the, the old school thinking that you went out to the desert to meet the demons and fight with the demons. Well, really, it's about an internal struggle. Uh, and anyone can be involved in that as a Christian. Anyone can practice works of compassion. Um, and so Basil rejects this idea that there are levels of Christianity, that you know, somehow the monks are better than everybody else, so the, the celibates are you know, on a higher spiritual plane. He actually rejects that idea, and he, he really doesn't even call his monks monks. He just calls everybody brothers and sisters. Um, and he rejects the idea that, that non-celibate or non-ascetic Christians are somehow second-class citizens um, or should be criticized. He rejects any idea that marriage should be condemned as unworthy or anything like that. Now, he, so he has all these ideas about monasticism and what it's supposed to be like, uh, but he was never really able to live it out because he was pulled into the administrative office of the episcopacy. So. Um, instead, he planned to build a city, a, 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 like a city on the outskirts of the town that was going to be like a little complex with a hospital, with a leper wing, and a host hostel for pilgrims, and a monastery, and a school, and shops, and a welfare office, and it was going to do all of this stuff. And that ideal for monasticism as being a part of a community that reaches out is really um, the, the basis for medieval monasticism. Even though it's not clear that he ever really actually built this thing, but that was the idea, and he wrote about it. Now, as far as um, theology, Basil's main contribution to theology is um, in this conversation about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Basil is the one to propose that the Spirit proceeds from the Father, he'll say from the Father through the Son. He doesn't go so far as to say that the Holy Spirit is homoousios or consubstantial. But he does say that the Holy Spirit is the giver of life and is to be worshipped and glorified. Words that find their way into the creed. Um, now why is that significant? Think about it. The Holy Spirit is giver of life, not receiver of life. So that speaks to the Spirit's divinity. The Holy Spirit is not the recipient of, of life, but a source of life. And the Holy Spirit is to be worshipped and glorified along with the Father and Son. So also that speaks to the Spirit's divinity as well. So you'll, you know, he doesn't go quite as far as maybe you know, Gregory of Nazianzus would want him to, but we're going to see each one takes it a little bit farther. You are going to read Basil's document on the Holy Spirit. And when you read that, especially look for the doctrine of inseparable operation as an argument for the divinity of the Spirit. In other words, right, all divine activity is uh, the result of all three persons of the Trinity acting together. All three persons of the Trinity 
are involved in all divine activity. So, inseparable operation. Yeah. I mean, this should be this this stuff should be kind of old hat to you by now. But it, inseparable operation has been something that came up in the discussion about the relationship between the Father and the Son. But now Basil extends that to the Spirit as well. Inseparable operation means all three persons of the Trinity are involved in all divine activity. And if that's the case, then that means the Holy Spirit is divine. So that becomes the argument, or an argument for the divinity of the Spirit. In 379, Basil was only 49 years old. Um, which occurs to me that's how old I am right now. Uh, but I have not yet <laughs> ruined my health through extreme asceticism. In fact, um, I'd probably go to the other extreme. Uh, so Basil was, uh, was such an extreme ascetic that he ruined his health and uh, you know, he lived only to be 49. After he died, the two Gregories were kind of out from under his shadow, which allowed them then to come into their own as theologians. Not that they didn't write anything before his death, but you get the idea, especially the brother, Gregory of Nyssa, the younger brother. Um, and so, so let's uh, talk about Nyssa. But first, let me see if there are any questions about Basil. Yes? Now, when you say um, aesthetics, are, are we talking about a, like, a very simple life, like the apostles led? Uh, I, with with Basil especially, it's it's more than that. It's it's more than just living simply. It's living. Um, it's it's actually denying oneself things that we might consider necessities. You know, um, eating very little, sleeping very little, not sleeping on anything soft, not even sleeping laying down sometimes. Well, uh, never mind. I, I guess he was a bishop, not not, not the pope. So. Was, yeah, right. He's the bishop there. of Caesarea, yeah. yeah. Yes? Okay, you said that he appoints the Gregories to different places uh, for his political gain, but a little while back we talked about that you weren't allowed to do that anymore because it had to be from the location. Did that, like, die out, or what happened to that? Well, you know, th that's exactly right. And when, you know, I don't want to make it sound like he could just simply appoint them because he's, he doesn't have that kind of authority. What he has to do is work behind the scenes and lobby for their election. And but yes, I mean theoretically, if if Gregory is from Nazianzus, how does he get elected in Sassima? It shouldn't happen, but he's bending the rules. And certainly there would have been people who would have said something about it, but eventually he was able to make it happen. Now. Um, you use the phrase for his own political gain, and certainly that is true, although um, if we were to ask Basil, he would say it's not for himself, it's for the cause of Nicene Orthodoxy. It's to get, it's to get the Arians out of the office of bishop so that the Orthodox are in the office. Now, you may not think that's better, but that's what he would say. Yeah. Good question. All right. Okay, so let's talk about Gregory of Nyssa. He's born somewhere around 330, or depending on who you ask, 330, 334, 340, somewhere in the 330s. He died in 385, or 386, or 394, depending who you ask. So, you know, we're not exactly sure. Um, but uh, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that he died like in the 380s. <coughs> Maybe the late 380s. So, as I said, Basil had gotten him elected as Bishop of Nyssa. But, there were a lot of Arians in that city, and they immediately started trying to get rid of him. They got him um, accused of all kinds of trumped up charges, um, including theft, you know, uh, like he was accused of stealing money from the church. Um, he almost got thrown in jail, but fled, he took off, left the city. Um, at the end of the day, though, Gregory of Nyssa is really the only one of the three to be influential at the Council of Constantinople in 381. He was there. Now, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes that Nazianzus actually starts out as the chair of the council, but he quit. So, you know, 
bottom line is Nyssa is the one who, who is sort of the theologian at the Council of Constantinople. He wrote documents for the council, became the lead theologian there. After the council, he became uh, an advisor to the emperor, Theodosius. And he also wrote the life of Macrina that you're going to read. Now, when you read the life of Macrina, remember your rules about how to read ancient documents, right? There's an agenda here. What do you think Gregory of Nyssa's agenda is in writing the, the story of his sister? Say that louder, please. Um, to orthodoxy yes, right, to, pr to promote Nicene Orthodoxy. That's a big part of it. And anything else? To promote monasticism. Right? She's held up as, the, as a pioneer of the ascetic life, the life of philosophy. And so, um, anyway, it's not too long, and it's, uh, it's definitely uh, good to read. The theological document that you're going to read from Nyssa is called On Not Three Gods. <laughs> On Not Three Gods. Or, you know, a better translation might be something like, concerning the fact that we do not believe in three gods. And uh, this comes up because, you know, after Basil's On the Holy Spirit, some people were bound to say, well, look, if you're talking about the divinity of the Father and the divinity of the Son and the divinity of the Holy Spirit, that sounds like three gods. That sounds like tritheism. It sounds like you're worshiping three divinities. And so Gregory comes along and says, here's how it's not three gods. Here's how it's one god talking about the, um, the unity of God in spite of the fact that there are three divine persons. And the argument goes kind of like this. I'll give you, you know, the overview so you can have this in your head when you read it. The argument goes kind of like this. Um, and it, it has a lot to do with inseparable operation again. Inseparable operation, the fact that all three persons of, of the Trinity are involved in all divine activity. Inseparable operation is a function of divine simplicity. We've talked about divine simplicity before, but maybe not a lot, so I'll remind you. Divine simplicity is the doctrine that says that, that God is simplex. In some translations it says God is simple, but that makes it sound like God is dumb, so uh, I don't like that term. Uh, God is simplex, and by simplex we mean not composite, not composed of parts. God doesn't have parts because anything that has parts can then be taken apart or broken down into its parts. Anything that is made of parts can disintegrate into its parts. And God cannot disintegrate. There are no parts into which God can be broken down. So you can't call the three persons of the Trinity three parts of God. It doesn't work like that. God is one. And so this, this, the oneness of God is understood as God's simplicity. That God is one throughout. The one divinity without any division. Question here? Yeah, um, so did uh, Gregory of Nice then believe that um, all three parts of the Trinity were pre-existent to creation then as well? Yeah, right. All three persons of the Trinity are, are co-eternal. Because that's, that's sort of part and parcel with divinity. That's right. And so, um, so you know, if you start with the assumption of divine simplicity... Do you have a question? Okay. If you start with the assumption of divine simplicity, that naturally leads you to inseparable operation. Because if the Trinity doesn't have parts, you can't talk about the three persons of the Trinity off doing their own thing separately. So... Um, the three persons of the Trinity work together. Um, this also rules out the possibility of degrees of divinity. So, because there's no, there, there are no degrees of divinity such that the Father is the most divine, and the Son is a little less divine, and the Holy Spirit is a little less divine. None of that. There is, there is one divinity, and um, and the three persons share the one divinity, but not share as in divvy up, share as in e equally own the one divinity. And so that's, this is how, then, we are not talking about three gods. We're talking about the one God. Um, okay, so, you know, 
when we talk about uh, the the I erased it the language then. Um, Remember that this word hypostasis. Some people were using that word in the, to mean the same thing as essence. So if you say in Greek three hypostases, that, that the Trinity is three hypostases, some people are hearing that as if you're saying three substances, and that's why it sounds like three gods to some people. So Gregory of Nyssa has to emphasize the meaning of hypostasis as if to say. Three hypostases does not mean three gods. Jake, yes. Another question. Question over here. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Right. trying to follow here. So, was he still um, going with the whole hierarchy model though, of the Trinity? Where? Well, there's always a hierarchy in the Trinity, but um, he will say that the, the hierarchy cannot be ontological. In other words, it's not a hierarchy of being where the Father is something and the Son is something else on a lower scale, and then the spirit. It's not that kind of a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy that, that maintains the distinction between the three persons. Um, and in this case, the, the hierarchy is sort of described in terms of the proceeding. You know, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, but it's not an ontological hierarchy because ontologically, in terms of essence, the three are one. Good question, any other questions about Gregory of Nyssa? All right, so let me talk about Gregory of Nazianzus then. Uh, born around 325, or some say 329. It's always interesting to me that you know you can read different books and they can differ that much. I mean, it's four years, doesn't sound like a lot, but why pick 329 then if somebody else has picked 325? I don't know, and I don't claim to know. But... Um, Born in the 320s, shortly after the Council of Nicaea, died 389 or 390, somewhere around that. So I'll just say 390, just for the sake of argument here, but uh, somewhere around 389 or 390. Gregory of Nazianzus is actually another one of the four so-called Eastern doctors of the church. I don't know why Gregory of Nyssa gets passed over as one of the doctors of the church, especially since he seems to have been um, the more important one at the Council of Constantinople. But at any rate, Gregory of Nazianzus, the one we're talking about now, is um, known in the church as Gregory the Theologian. So we got Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and Basil's little brother. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gregory of Nazianzus. His father was actually the bishop of Nazianzus, um, and his father ordained him priest to, uh, to, to assist him. And Gregory didn't want to be ordained, and so the story is that he ran away for a short time and eventually came back. And, and, and actually, um, he would spend part of his life going back and forth, you know, sort of getting out of town and then... His father would get sick, and so he'd have to go back to help his father, and then he'd get out of town, and then his father passed away, so he had to go back to put things in order. And um, I think he's the one who first said, just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in. I think that's pretty sure. Or, or that might have been Michael Corleone, yeah. So now, was he doing all this while he was the bishop of um, Sassima? Sassima? Well, yeah, but he again, he never, he never, oh, he, never he, he never actually physically accepted that role because he never showed up there. So yeah, technically <laughs> technically he uh, he is. And, and actually that will come back to haunt him because when he is in Constantinople, someone's gonna say, hey, wait a minute, aren't you supposed to be the bishop of that little town? You know, <laughs> so yeah. Um, now, uh, actually at one point when, uh, when uh, his his uh, father had died, I believe, another heretical group tried to install one of their own as bishop in Nazianzus, and he, you know, he had to go there too. And this group, we're, we haven't talked about them, but we will, um, the Apollinarians. I think we're going to get to them next week. But uh, in this... In this time period between the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, yet another heresy will emerge uh, based on the teachings of a guy named Apollinarius. 
And so we'll get to that. I don't want to get off track. But, uh, but they're around as well. And so Gregory of Nazianzus keeps having to go back and forth back to Nazianzus. And when his father died, he became the acting bishop of Nazianzus. So there's some debate about whether he was ever officially the bishop of Nazianzus. But we call him that. And so I guess, I guess that means he was. Um, but in 379... In the year 379, he was invited by the Nicenes, the, the, the Orthodox, the pro-Nicenes in Constantinople, to come to be their bishop. Now, look, in the capital city of Constantinople, the official bishop was Arian. And so there's this minority party of Nicenes who occupy this little chapel and so they invited Gregory of Nazianzus to come and be their bishop, which would have meant two bishops in the city. Um, and, uh, and he did. And again, you know, this is where it's going to come up that, hey, aren't you supposed to be the bishop somewhere else? But eventually, a new emperor comes to the throne, Theodosius. And Theodosius is uh, orthodox. He's pro-Nicene. And so he is going to be uh, instrumental in putting an end to the, the back and forth between the Nicenes and the Arians. Emperor Theodosius. This is Theodosius the I. And um, he's anti-Arian. And, and so he has an interest in making sure that... Um, the Nicenes are in, are, are in the places where there are bishops, and so Gregory of Nazianzus is going to be the bishop then in Constantinople, briefly. In the year 380, the year 380, Theodosius issues an edict. The Edict of Thessalonica. You, you recognize that name from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, right? In Macedonia. Okay. Um, the Edict of Thessalonica says this. It, it basically does what Constantine never did. You know, the Emperor Constantine has the reputation for creating this marriage of church and state and, and um, for uh, making Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. But by now you know that's not the case. Constantine never did that. What Constantine did was issue an edict giving freedom of religion to all religions. Now Theodosius comes along and he's in a bit of a different position because after all the back and forth with Arianism, um, we're, we're, and, and actually after a brief stint with a pagan emperor, Julian, Theodosius wants to uh, solidify the position of Christianity within the empire, and specifically Nicene Christianity. So he is going to say, by the way, folks, Christianity is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. And he's going to go, go so far as to say, and here's what I mean by Christianity, because that Arian stuff won't do. The true faith is the Nicene faith. And the Edict of Thessalonica... Uh, in 380, basically says this. It says that the faith of the Roman Empire that everyone is expected to accept is the faith that Peter delivered to the Romans. So notice, an Eastern Emperor putting Rome in first place. Now, he also goes, it goes on to say, and which is also taught in the city of Alexandria, so, but, but Alexandria is mentioned um, in the sense that it agrees with Rome. So, again, we're going to get around to a lecture on the development of the uh, office of Bishop of Rome, the Bishop of Rome as the papacy. And uh, along the way, I'm just pointing out the sort of stepping stones on that road. And this is another one of those stepping stones where the, the Christian faith is, is now defined by the emperor as the faith that Peter delivered to the Romans. Um, 
So anyway, um, Gregory of Nazianzus was probably uh, behind this and at least instrumental in, in defining this. And uh, you are going to read a section from his theological orations, um, specifically the, the bit on the Holy Spirit. So continuing the discussion on pneumatology of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in his writing, Gregory solidifies uh, the term procession as the specific term that refers to the Holy Spirit. The Son is begotten, the Holy Spirit proceeds. And so here we get, again, I, I've talked about this a little bit in the past, but when we talk about the, the, uh, the doctrine of appropriation, where um, anything you can say about one person of the Trinity, you have to be able to say about the others. Um, or anything you can say about the Trinity as a whole, you have to be able to say about uh, each person of the Trinity, with those few exceptions. And so here, again, um, Gregory is solidifying the exception word that relates to the Holy Spirit. So the Father is the only one who, who can be said to be unbegotten. The Son is the only one who can be said to be begotten or generated. And the Holy Spirit proceeds. That's the specific word about the Spirit. And then he says, beyond this, it's a mystery, so don't ask. I mean, that's where, we, that's where he gets apophatic on us. Um, okay, so as uh, Bishop of Constantinople now, we come to the year 381 and the Council of Constantinople, and so naturally, Gregory of Nazianzus was chosen by the emperor to be the chair of the Council of Constantinople. So here we are. 381, the Second Ecumenical Council, the Council of Constantinople. And like I said, this is one of those dates that everyone should have memorized, whether they care or not. <laughs> Nicaea 325, Constantinople 381. And if I meet you 30 years from now, I better be able to say, what year was the Council of Constantinople? It would be like 381, of course. <laughs> So um, the problem is, is that Gregory of Nazianzus did not remain chair of the council for very long because he was disillusioned by what he considered to be the politics of it all. Now, by politics, though, part of the politics was the attempt on the part of many of the bishops uh, of trying not to alienate too many people, but instead looking for as much consensus as possible. Because think about it. If you're going to be defining the boundaries of orthodox or correct theology, you really want to define those boundaries as widely as possible, as wide as you can stand it, so that you don't alienate too many people. Because if you define the boundaries too narrowly, you won't get a majority to vote for it at the council, right? So the, uh, the, 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 the vibe at the council was to draw those boundaries a little wider to try and bring in some of these people who maybe used to be Arians or were semi-Arians and, and get them on board with Nicene theology. Um, not in the sense of compromise. It's not that, it's not that um, orthodoxy can be compromised in that sense because, you know, uh, the understanding is that there are right answers and there are wrong answers. You know, it's not like if, you know, if I say 2 plus 2 is 6, and you say 2 plus 2 is 4, it's not as though we can agree on 5 and I'll be happy with that because, you know, that's not how it works. There's still a right answer. But, so it's not about compromise. It's about saying less to include more. It's about saying as little as you have to to get the job done so you include as many people as possible, um, and so that you don't alienate the the semi Aryans whom they hoped would get on board. Yeah, question here. Yeah, realistically, like how many Aryans or semi Aryans would have been at this council to even vote on this? In the ah, good question. How many? Uh, how many are we talking about? Um, I don't offhand know the answer to that, um, but you know, again, th it is it's not as though they went into the council. You know, absolutely sure of, of of a victory for Nicene Orthodoxy. I mean, because I think there's a sense that you know, if they just came back to the council with the creed from Nicaea, slapped it on the table, and said, "Well, sign up," 
that might not have worked. And in fact, you remember when we were talking about the creed, that in the original creed of Nicaea, there were two instances of, of usia language, two spots that had that essence language. And when you look at the creed after Constantinople, one of them's gone. So there, you know, a concession is made um, to the to the semi areas in order to get them on board. So um, I'd have to look up the, the actual numbers. Yeah, it seems like it would be really easy for you know Theodosius, who's against Arianism, and Gregory, who's against Arianism. If they're in charge of this council, it'd be easy for them just to not invite the Arians. And ah, I see. Decision. Yeah, well, that that uh, that wouldn't be fair. Well, <laughs> well I mean that then you know that wouldn't be really. Be all fair, then it thing. wouldn't be ecumenical. It wouldn't be an ecumenical council. You have to invite everybody. Yeah. Now the problem becomes. That um, with the first two ecumenical councils, we don't have a lot of good records in terms of who was there, who wasn't there. So, like with Nicaea, for example, you know, depending on who you read, some say there were you know over 300 bishops there, some say there were 200 and something, um, and so you know some of them might be counting deacons and priests and lay people. Other, so it's it's hard to know. So even at the Council of Constantinople, it's not clear. It's not until the third ecumenical council that we start having like minutes from the council. You know. So, uh, anyway, that's a good question. Um, all right, so if Gregory of Nazianzus had had his way, the creed would have proclaimed the Holy Spirit also homoousios with the Father and Son. But you'll notice it doesn't do that. It says the Son is homoousios with the Father, but it doesn't use that word of the Holy Spirit. Um, in fact, Gregory of Nazianzus, as I hinted earlier, criticized Basil for not going farther in talking about the consubstantiality of the Spirit. And so, you know, when you read the theological orations, you'll see that Nazianzus goes the farthest of the three of them in terms of explicitly talking about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, but the creed itself, um, the bishops felt, could not go any farther than it did. It couldn't say any more on the spirit than it did because they were afraid of, of alienating the homoiousions or whomever. Um, and so they took out that phrase from the usia of the father, from the essence of the father. And, um, and so Gregory resigned over this kind of stuff and went back to his home to be Bishop of Nazianzus again. And um, in the end, the creed does not go so far as to say that the Holy Spirit is consubstantial or homoousios with the Father and Son. Um, so he quit, turned in his resignation as both chair of the council and bishop of Constantinople, went back to be bishop of Nazianzus, and, um, and then even there, only stayed bishop of Nazianzus until a successor could be elected, and then he retired to live the life of a hermit. Um, when you read the, the fifth theological oration on the Holy Spirit. Notice also that there's another argument that pops up that some people were apparently saying that the Holy Spirit is not a substance, but is an accident. Do you know what, you know what I mean by an accident, philosophically? Now, I don't mean that it was a mistake or that something suddenly and unexpectedly happened. An accident is something that is sort of tangential to the essence. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but uh, I am a human being, so my humanity is, is essential to who I am. The fact that I'm wearing a red striped shirt is not essential to who I am. It is accidental to who I am, so it's an accident. Now what that might mean for the Trinity is that some people seem to be arguing that the Holy Spirit is not of the same substance as the Father and Son, but is an accident, is accidental to the Trinity, as in maybe the Holy Spirit is uh, a, uh, an energy of the Father and Son. Or in some cases, even the analogy that the Holy Spirit could be the love that's shared by the Father and Son makes the Holy Spirit sound sort of accidental to the, to the Trinity. Um, and so... You will also notice in the theological oration that he's arguing against that too, that the Holy Spirit is not accidental to the Trinity, but that the Holy Spirit is substance and is consubstantial with the Father and Son. 
Okay, now, any questions about uh, Gregory of Nazianzus? <laughs> all right, let me just say a couple more things and then we'll be ready to take a break. Bless you. Um, all right, so we talked about the idea of divine simplicity and how divine simplicity naturally leads to inseparable operation. In other words, if God is simplex, then, then the three persons of God can't be off doing separate things, but must be working together. Um, so divine simplicity sort of logically leads to inseparable operation. Inseparable operation logically leads to appropriation. And all of this logically leads to uh, a concept called perichoresis. Uh, put up here. Perichoresis. 